It's the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and talk about various topics in and surrounding communicating ideas visually. Uh, we think we, we pick a topic once a week and drill down super uh, as deep as we can go with it. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and a teaching artist. And the other host is? Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger, a uh, user experience designer and game designer. Good to see you again. Ah, it's good to see you. Thank you, Jersey, for last week's um, somewhat last minute uh, rebroadcast episode. That that saved that saved me because uh, I was uh, I was having a cough, coughing evening, lots of you know some kind of battling of a some kind of bug. Man, it it sounds like it was it was a pretty intense one. Um, but yeah, that's that's why we have that's one of the reasons we have broadcast rebroadcast episodes sort of like locked and loaded in a uh, a Google Doc so that we can quickly mm-hmm. you know have loose knees in the deck of the ship in case something happens and we've got over two hundred episodes in an archive. Surely there's stuff worth revisiting in there, and I hope everybody enjoyed uh, our conversation with Lee Sherollis and Samantha Kyle. In uh, I forget what episode it was, but um, talking about getting out in front of an audience like that that whole extra part of being a visual communicator is that you have to present your ideas to people right whether it's pitching at a at a at a meeting with publishers or with products people or whether it's getting up and doing a talk in front of people so yeah there was a lot of fun a lot of fun with doing that episode with them um i probably what a year and a half two years ago and uh, glad to bring it back. And one th- one thing that's that's neat about the rebroadcasts, it isn't just like oh, we get you know, it's a it's a way to like take a break yet still um, be in be in touch and still show up in the feed and have something useful. There are um, it's not as easy to like go back to the archive, right? Because I think you can, if you subscribe to our podcast, which I hope you have, and you know, hope you do. But um, so when you do, like you get basically the last hundred episodes. And that's just how the feed works with where we currently host. And um, we have greater than 100 episodes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that, that, yeah. And if, if you are a completionist and you would like to, to dive through that, you know, there's pretty much uh, going to the website is the easiest way. Uh, lean into art.com. But, um, but yeah, so it's, an, it's a couple other happy side effects of the uh, rebroadcast. But we're uh, but we got a fresh topic for this week. Um, mm-hmm. Warm ups. Um, I might frame it up, Rob. Uh, I just started another round of teaching. Uh, my tenth year of teaching now. Um, and as I was getting ready to work with these different groups of young people, the kids and teens, uh, it occurred to me that it might be fun to experiment with discrete, very short. Um, a, an exercise to sort of get them to practice a comic storytelling technique, but in a way that isn't very explicit, where it feels like it's a fun, silly thing just to have fun, uh, just have a good time and and get your drawing hand sort of into shapes for like the real work ahead for the day, right? Hmm. Um, and I started digging into some books because like, you know, I've, I've come up with lots of my own kinds of warm ups, but I thought, well, you know, it, it might be a good idea to get some different points of view on this. Uh, and it just so happened that uh, last week I did a talk at University of Michigan Dearborn and in my research for the talk, I came across or sort of reintroduced myself to the work of Linda Berry. I don't know if you're how familiar you are with her with her work, but um, um, a little bit I've caught a video now and then. Uh, she's That's a, right. she's a treasure and has so many, um, such a, a fun, spriteful, playful, uh, way that's, that's approachable and, and honest to just invite everyone to come, to, come on down and, and, uh, and join in on the creative work. Great cartoonist, thinker, art philosopher. And, uh, she has a blog, the nearsighted monkey.tumblr.com, which we will refer to a couple times, I'm sure in the up, upcoming talk, but, um, or upcoming discussion. But she has a book called Syllabus, which um, you can find at bookstores everywhere, which is this sort of, um, it's like, it's like, it's ruminations on art in sort of notebook form, but also with sort of 
discrete warm-up exercises these these things that feel like they're not related to uh bigger more ambitious projects they're just like a done in one kind of thing just to sort of like set the mind to the work that needs to be done right um and as i was digging through that i was like uh it got me thinking that it'd be a good topic to bring into the show, but also um, to examine this idea of um, going back to some of that monastic thinking in just checking in to do the thing rather than trying to do work that adds up to an external thing, right? This is like intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic, maybe, um, in that hmm. an activity that you're doing purely for your own benefit, and it, it doesn't necessarily need to be... Um, accumulative in in any kind of external visible way right but yet um, the your the the monastic concept would be it has an internal accumulation yes so this I would is say that, yeah. some kind of a creative build up that you know you're 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 getting uh i don't i suppose like you you engage in a creative task and something happened and no one got hurt and everything's all right and maybe it was interesting maybe it was fun maybe there was uh some mild aspect of the task itself and it, and it gets you moving so you go from maybe one context oh you're you know administrative ta tasks you're doing your taxes or or dealing with bills or whatever and then and or or you're doing emailing and communication marketing and pick pick a hat but then oh i gotta make stuff and it's a different mode and you don't have to jump right into the big the big process or procedure to be chipping away at like the, the whatever your your next project for you or a client you you can dip your toe conversation i had with my students today i'm going to talk about one of the exercises that we just did today in class is um i said anybody here watch uh dragon ball anybody here watch naruto um a lot of training in those shows. A lot of people undergoing a lot of what seems to be unrelated activities to the incoming threat. And I also, you know, I, of course, longtime listeners and viewers of the show know that you and I are big Karate Kid fans. This is wax on, wax off. It doesn't seem like you're doing much until Mr. Miyagi says, show me sand the floor. And then things get interesting, right? Um, that's kind of the idea that we're probably going to explore in a second here. And with that, you know, since we're talking about Dragon Ball, how about, you know... Go 10, I knew feet it up. Didn't me. Yeah, I know. I do my <laughs> my giddy shuffle. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we're talking about this idea of like like incorporating warm up activities into some kind of regular regular experience, um, and what benefits that we might derive from that. And I thought we could start by just talking about some of these ones that I've been using in my classrooms that I found that the kids they. I think they really enjoyed it. I don't know if the learning was immediately apparent to them, but that's kind of the point, right? At least in my my estimate as a teacher is that I don't want to stop everything and say, and now you've learned to do this, right? I want it to be something where it's through repetition and through exposing them to these different techniques, it's sort of suggesting and uh, presenting by example concepts that will become much more fleshed out and familiar to them as they explore art throughout their lives. Um, so, hmm. how about I start? Hmm. Well, it's, so, I mean, it's very much the, I mean, well, okay, now practicing this kind of thing, you, if you're facilitating, you're the Miyagi in this situation. That's kind of fun. Where, <laughs> yeah. I'm not telling you I'm actually teaching you how to low block, but sand the floor. Surprise. Right. Right. And 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 I as a teacher am keeping track of things that they say and, and react to as they engage with these activities because um in the coming weeks when we start putting comics together, I'm going to bring those experiences back into when they're struggling. That's my goal at least. That's oh, that's awesome. Okay. So it's not well, it's not just the intangible practice. Well, not for me. I mean, I mean, okay. like you said, like in the, in this context, I'm an instructor, right? So it's upon me to sort of explicitly knit these things together for them, and then hope that whatever they don't pick up this time around, maybe years later they'll remember. Oh, this is just like when that old idiot art teacher that I had that I no longer respect. Cause I'm a teenager now, and everything's lame. Uh, he once said to me, and boy, maybe he was smarter than I thought. 
Um, but 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 it, I th there is there is a dual there is a, a different context that we're talking about because like us as practicing artists, I think another interesting angle to explore would be like what would we gain from incorporating these like in a non classroom environment. Um, mm. Do you mind if I just start with talking about one of the lessons oh, yeah. I was using? So you were, yeah, which book were you going to dive into first? So first, I want to talk about uh, Ivan Brunetti's cartooning, uh, mm. philosophy and practice. Have you ever seen this? No, but it looks very cartoon modern, that uh, that cover. That yeah, cover he, the, uh... Ivan Brunetti has a very distinct style, and he, and he encourages in a lot of his activities to really focus on um, using geometric figures right keeping it simple mm -hmm. so that the um that your interaction is more with storytelling itself rather than worrying about representation or illustrative beauty right just let's just use a simple shape as a matter of fact this this uh the first warm up i wanted to talk about is this one right here which i'll describe in detail in a moment but i'm putting it up mm -hmm. on the screen so you can see what he's what he's talking about as i describe this it so could be very much drawn with uh rulers and a, a protractor right or a compass if you're yes if you're really worried about like line quality you could break out all those tools and do this mm. uh very effectively and uh, but i would recommend even not even worrying about that mm. um so this is his uh his four panel exercise and what i did and i think it was actually right according to the it's exercise 4.1 on page 42 of ivan bernetti's cartooning which you can get it your local bookstore um you start out with four index cards and you um and actually I, I had the kids have an extra separate sheet of paper to start with and they had five minutes to uh draw the following items right so they're not drawing a story they're not drawing a comic they're just drawing objects to start out with and give them a five minute timer on this um a character made of geometric shapes and a pattern right so we can see this character in his story is made of a circle a triangle and then just like stick arms and legs but then there's a pattern on the character's torso like they're wearing a striped shirt mm -hmm. or something right and then you are to design an environment so are they at the park are they at the mall are they in, um on the moon you know where is this place so just draw like a a simple horizon line with a few things you'd find in that environment right just and it doesn't even have to have the character in it just someplace on the sheet of paper you're just drawing it just so you have some kind of visual reference and then you draw a prop the prop is just some some kind of object for the character to interact with very simple very straightforward not a whole lot of uh, heavy lifting to do on this it's uh, it's in it's Again, it's one of those things like like sand the floor where it's deceptively simple, right? It, it you're doing more than you think you are when you're making these choices. So then break out the four index cards, and with five minutes each, five minutes, you draw a short story of a character interacting with the prop. So if we look in the middle four of this page, this is the story he began with. Uh, this young person comes up upon a tree, leaf falls down, character contemplates the leaf. And then they kick the leaf, right? So that'd be 20 minutes of drawing. And hmm. uh, Ivan even suggests that like you keep the shot on the horizontal so that you're not like, unless it's really necessary to get up close to look at the details on the prop for some reason, um, keep it on the horizontal because this is just about examining cause and effect and characters just interacting with the world that you've sort of quickly constructed for them, right? And so uh project completed you got four a four panel comic series and four different index index cards then i go around the room again i'm like here's two more here's two more index cards now you're gonna have five minutes to draw the two moments that came after your ending all right so now we're gonna do two more and we can show at the bottom of this all right so she right. stops and considers the leaf and then oh oh and this is an important thing i forgot to mention this comic cannot have words no sound so no word balloons, no sound effects, a completely oh silent pantomime comics. You're really focusing on the character's interaction with the prop, right? Um, and then five minutes to the sec second to last panel and five minutes for the final panel. Then I go around the room one more time with two more index cards like, ah, but we're not done yet. Now you're gonna do the two moments that precede the beginning of your story, right? And the way, I don't remember if Ivan actually mentioned this as as a, a benefit of exploring this but i pointed out to them i said you know sometimes we don't know what a character's motivation is for sure until we've finished the whole story so now you've got this opportunity to show or at least examine or explore or 
potentially try to find, why are why is that character there in the first place? What led them to that moment, right? So um, I remember demoing this as I went along, and I did one story where, um, oh, what was it? It was it was a oh, <laughs> it was a young woman, and her, uh, it was the um, the Saguaro National Park in Arizona, which is all like those cacti, like the the platonic ideal of cactus, right? Like the two Ooh, arms, like this, yeah. And then it was a, uh, a a dead fish was the prop, and and I and I did this like I went along with the class. I'm like I don't know what I'm gonna do with these things. I'm just putting together three incongruous things, and we'll see what I find. And so it starts out with the gal in the park, and she comes in panel two. She comes upon a dead fish in the middle of Saguaro National Park. Ew. Panel three, she picks up the fish, and we see the stink lines coming off, and she's making a disgusted face. So now we have, like, without using dialogue, showing that she's reacting to the fish. Then panel four is her at, back at home frying the fish and kind of shrugging her shoulders. And the kids all go, oh, what? And I'm like, okay, well, now I'm going to go back and do the first two panels. And we show her wake up that morning. Uh, her stomach's rumbling, and she opens her wallet, and a moth comes out. Well, now she, we know that she's hungry, and she doesn't have any money for food. So if that now we know why she picked up a dead fish on the ground. That kind of idea. Nothing... Mm. This isn't Tolstoy, but it's uh, it's demonstrating to us that we can retroactively find meaning in things that we apparently um, uh, guess at or improvise on the page, right? That's uh, okay, and it really seems like that's the point of the exercise: is to get you you get past a, a couple of stages of expressing yourself, right? You have nothing and then some limitations, some constraints, and then you produce a little something. And then through safe, simple procedure, you extend that something. But then now that you're extending it, you're in this different safe zone of creativity where you're, it's not the blank page anymore. It's uh, you're practicing the, the editing and the reshaping and layering on additional meaning. That's that, uh, which is, I don't know, it's a, it's a position that you can put yourself in when you're refining your other work, but like, this is such a lower cost way to practice that versus, you know, I, you did thumbnails for, I don't know, even a mini comic. This is faster than that. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is like, well, we're talking about 20 minutes worth of work for the initial four panels plus another 20 minutes for the last four panels. Um, with a five minute front end on designing your character and, and prop and environment. So it's, it's, it could be done in a lunch hour really right mm -hmm. um or, or pretty close to that um and also it demonstrates and this is the kind of thing where i'm going to connect them with this hopefully later on is that one of the hardest things is starting you know our very first episode i think of this entire endeavor lean into art was i think it was called starting is hard right <laughs> yeah i think so <laughs> or maybe maybe that was like the second episode i can't remember but it was like a, one of the very first ones was it's an early one is, yeah yeah and why? Because when you start, you have a million choices. And what gets you, what gets you momentum often, not always, but often, um, is the hemming in that making those first choices provides. Those lim like the moment you start committing to anything, you're hemming yourself in, creating these limitations that actually encourage you to be more creative in order to figure out how to navigate that and how to make it all make sense, right? Yeah. And the having it it's it's really easy it's the um there's a book that we've mentioned a few different times uh um it's like a the gentleman who wrote is van oak and it's the, a whack on the side of the head and it's the um he has sort of a a set of different jobs or roles for a model of creative for for, for doing creative effort right and those different hats, like you can give them different assignments or whatnot, but you can see how like they can get in the way if you do them in the wrong order. So if, if you go from an, um, I think he goes from the explorer to the artist, to the judge, to the, who, oh, to the executioner. I don't know what it was, what was the last one. The last one is basically the project manager. Before that is the editor. And before that, it's like you're, you're, you're shaping and, and working with your ideas. But before that, you're actually accumulating the ideas. And if you try to jump straight to the editing uh, too early, you're going to get in your own way because you haven't allowed yourself to necessarily maybe explore and generate enough to uh, either um, discover your message or discover the way you want to say it in, in 
in some some manner that resonates well with you. So it's that's yeah. So these warm up exercises, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear about another because uh, this is uh, huh. It's a, it's just, it's, it's an awesome way to get the practice without getting tripped up. Cause it's, a, it's also a safe other thing, right? The safe other thing. That's not my main project. I'm not my, I don't have as much skin in this game. I'm not as hung up on the, um, I don't really like the, the hairstyle on this character I made. I'm like, you're not worried about that. Right. Right. Uh, a lot of the kids, uh, well, not a lot, but a, a good number of the kids when I, did this initial that first five minute piece where it's like design a character design an environment uh one of the number one questions was is like is this a character we'd have to use for multiple sessions like are we stuck with this character and i was like no <laughs> this is a throwaway done in one fun little thing this is nothing you're committed to you know which that it, from a t t teacher's standpoint is like that's kind of like a hit or miss like i i'm I'm not sold on that as like the perfect response to the situation because some of them took that as, well, now I don't have to try, right? It's like there, there, there is no, I, I took their skin out of the game by saying that, right? Whereas other ones that calmed them down and relaxed. I mean, it's just, it's so interesting how when you're working with a group of people, you're always oscillating between these different levels of anxiety. You get like people who are very high in anxiety and it's like, is this going to be dangerous? Is this going to, am I going to be committed to this? Are these things that I'm doing now going to have any kind of repercussions later on? Right. And then there's the low anxiety people where it's like, Oh, I don't have to try very hard. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's always a negotiation you, game between the How two do you groups. keep it engaging? Right. Right. It's a little yeah. bit of a game design endeavor where you're, you're having to customize it for, um, for a variety of different interests and motivations. That's, that's a fun extra layer on top of this, but, uh, and I, I only bring that up because I imagine that there's different, those two groups exist amongst the people who participate in the stuff that we make too, right? Um, I just led a workshop for teachers a few months back and we're talking with like professional, well-educated, intelligent, uh, observant, and, uh, you know, adults who listen very well. And I still ran into the same kind of thing where it's like, if I let some people off the hook, quote unquote, um, they didn't engage quite as fully as they could have. Whereas other people, if I was like too prescriptive, they were like, ah, I can't now because it's too many rules and I've, too many ways I can fail, you know? Um, so mileage may vary and a little self-knowledge about where you fall on that spectrum might be a good idea in the way you, you play these games. Um, you well, want yeah, to talk and about especially yeah. you're facilitating, we're, we're mostly talking about facilitating yourself through these kinds of warmups, but then, I mean, there is that the extra interesting angle when you are trying to facilitate too, which I mean that uh, you could take away either from from this episode, and you just you you know what you're getting into, your your own your own psychology and and in motivation or a whole group of people's. <laughs> <laughs> so this next one, um, it comes from Linda Berry's syllabus which again, you can find at bookstores mm -hmm. everywhere. And this exercise is called the basic drawing jam. Bring it up so we can see it on the screen. Oh gosh, I just love, I love her, her, her art so much. I love how playful it is. I love how it oscillates back and forth between image and, and text. Um, anyway, I'll describe it. Mm -hmm. And we can see, we can see there's a grid of pictures yeah, there. Yeah, there's a lot of different styles in, in, just in that one grid of, one grid of pictures. Where, right. So yes, here's here's the outcome on, you know, this you page have here. Things right. that are just like the the flattened two D, but then you have characters that have more like actually like three D form to them, and uh, then then yeah, and then different levels of expressiveness and detail, um, but they're all sort there. You can tell they're all like lively, rapidly, you know, put to page. And, and rapid is is the name of the game. So what do you do? So you start by creating a grid of 16 squares on a sheet of paper. Um, and then, so it's four by four. And then on the top of each row, you put like essentially a caption box, a place to put text, right? And then you start once everybody's got that. And this, oh, I should say, this one is really, really good with a group. I was doing it with groups of 10 kids. And it was it was really really fun and had a lot of lively energy to it. So, this is the kind of thing where, if you have like an art group that you hang out with, if you go to like a drink and draw or something, this would be a fun thing to roll out to like as, as both like, like an icebreaker, but also as just a way to like warm up for whatever you're going to draw that 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 session. 
Um, but it also could be done alone if if you wanted to use it as that kind of uh, as like a, a single done in one warm up for yourself. But grid of 16 squares, and then like I said, a top row, uh, a smaller box at the uh, at the top of each row of boxes to put text in there. And then you have 10 seconds each box to write down an occupation. So in the case of uh, you know Linda Berry's example, robber, detective, barbarian, bro, DJ, smoker, princess, babysitter, milkmaid, and so on. Um, <laughs> Viking, pirate. <laughs> Floppy Frank is the last one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. But, um, but anyway, so... So you start at the first box in the upper left-hand corner, and you have 10 seconds to write down the name of the job. Boom, 10 seconds is over. Pass the page to your left. Everybody passes their page to their left. You're sitting in a circle, right? Oh, so now, so nice now you have somebody there. else's sheet, right? Yeah, now you 10 seconds to write down the next job. All right, I write down detective, right? All right, 10 seconds is up. Pass it to your left. And it gets passed all the way around. All the pages get passed around. Everybody writes different jobs. This... I don't think Linda Berry explicitly said this in the in the lesson, but what I inferred from it is that this is a great way to keep people from hacking the game because they are not in control of what ultimately they're going to be drawing on these sheets, right? Mm. So this goes around for all 16 rounds of uh, 10 seconds each until all the jobs are filled. And there's some negotiations that happen with my students where some of them are like, do they have to be real jobs? And like, you know, Every third one, you can make a funny job if you have a really. But I said, I said to them, I was like, it better be really funny. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like that. That is the good kind of skin in the game, right? It's like you, you better really make me laugh on this one. Okay, well, I, I'll do my best. So these all get passed around, and then for the the next rounds, uh, you have one minute, sixty seconds to draw, to capture with an image whatever that occupation is. And so now you're, I mean, okay, I'm going to back away and talk about what Miyagi's thinking while this is happening, is you're really talking about capturing an abstract idea and an activity in a single image in 60 seconds or less. So you don't have time to think about it and fuss with it. You certainly don't have time to worry about making a great drawing. It's for focusing you to think conceptually and to do what cartoonists do all the time, which is create an image that suggests a variety of moments all at the same time, right? Um, that is not front-ended into this activity. This is just like draw what's in the box. Um, and I actually have an example from my classroom here. Uh, it got scatological really fast. Uh -huh. <laughs> there was some that was like, oh, we got filmmaker. That was pretty good, right? <laughs> Somebody was actually like cutting film. I thought well, that's uh, pretty aware of uh, you know the history of the medium. But then there was some you know, hair yanker. I'm like, okay, well, uh, an idiot. Yeah. But then the best one was somebody put uh, butt wiper as a job. And it oh. comes around to the student and they look up at me and they're like, how do I do this? Like, what's a butt wiper? I'm like, well, you know, that's a, you could say that that's a job for somebody who like has, uh, is, is assisting somebody who is disabled in some way, like they have no use of their arms. Um, or it could be something wildly imaginative I said, I'd leave it up to you, but certainly don't draw anything that you wouldn't want your parents to see, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Good guy. You want to see what, see what this yeah. student did? Uh, this weird um, black mirror image <laughs> that this person came up with. <laughs> so they came up with this thing where people stick their butts in holes in a wall, and then people oh. go up behind it and wipe their butts for them. Oh, wow. So I pictured this as like an art installation of, <laughs> uh, it's like, but it's a statue of butts. A statue of butts. Oh, that could be it. So uh, and, you, know, you have to maintain the installation. So if you happen to in, if you happen to maintain an installation of butts, then you're a, a butt wiper. wiper. So, <laughs> anyway. Oh, I wish I would have had that spin on it. That's that's how I could have interpreted it. Um, <clears throat> but you know, they they kind of did one of these like, well, I just I did I did my best, you know. Uh, it, I, it was a teachable moment because I got to teach the kids the word scatological. You know, where oh. does scatological come from? It comes from the word scat. What scat? There we go. Right. But anyway, um, I have a quick this, thing to throw onto this, right? So, like, if you are yes. doing this alone, you you don't have the the benefit of like. So maybe you would enjoy generating all the occupations, right? Or maybe you could just mm -hmm. um, pause this episode, right, and like take the occupations from the from the video uh, that mm -hmm. Jersey held up. But like, um, you could actually use. Uh, I mean, there are so many things that are interesting for prompts that um, like random generators, essentially. 
that are a Google search away, right? So there's there's this really a fairly um, a fairly legit looking um, one called Fantasy Name Generators, but one of them has profession names, right? And it's just straight up. So it generated a list of professions: pilot, dancer, wine merchant, barber, rope maker, necromancer, distiller, photographer, archer, engraver, and you know, so you can use good old internet utility um, to help uh, move along your exercise too. If you're, this if you're is, not in a group is, of people. Is this fantasy name generators.com slash profession names.php? Is that the one yeah. you used? Yep. Yep. All right. I'll pull it up on the screen so people can see it. Uh, we'll know what they're looking for. For those who are visually oriented like me. So there you go. Um, and another another one that I had at the ready in in the event of because this is going to happen, you know, you, you put this pressure on of like ten seconds, come up with another occupation name. Now come up with another one, right? Mm -hmm. um, for for the again that the, those people who react um, who don't who don't react as as happily to that kind of pressure, I pre wrote a whole bunch of them on little slips of paper and just put them in a cup. And I'm oh, like, that's okay, you can't think of one. Here's a cup pick one out you know it's like and then they, they were half of them or like three quarters of them were like very serious ones like you know soldier um, spy doctor uh, and that kind of thing then there was a few silly ones in there too right um ice cream taste tester that kind of thing so <laughs> so yeah so like even if you didn't want to use like an online generator you could like generate a whole bunch like say you do 20 or 30 and then you just randomly pick them out of a cup kind of thing um to get your your occupation it, yeah, it, it adds that little the the spice of of a a prompt that's not fully in your control which that's where the group of people was a, a pretty great aspect of the exercise and other ones other uh additional layers i might add on and i might do this with my students and i have done these kinds of things in the past was i would say all right give me all your pencils nobody's using pencils we're using crayons you got crayons and you got to draw it this big do your best you know that kind of thing <laughs> um the the equivalent of putting the blast shield down in front of luke's face like okay well i'm gonna make it really really hard for you to do a really good job of this thing right um and and that kind of failure i think is very very fun and maybe i feel like we're getting to ten thousand feet up in a second here when i start talking about that that kind of thing yeah i think so i think i think we're about there that's the those are some there's a, those are two great books you mentioned and i i own neither now i need to now i need to uh look into those and of course we'll link to those in the show notes right yeah we will and i highly highly recommend them both once again it's ivan brunetti's cartooning and linda berry's syllabus mm -hmm. um absolutely terrific um okay so how about in one minute and 30 seconds we will talk a little bit about like mm, some of the 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 thinking about what benefits might might derive from this and how how we think differently about creating art that we ultimately are not going to do anything with right like my students i asked them so like you guys you guys want this and they were like no <laughs> like, all right i'll take it because these are great <laughs> um excellent we'll talk about like what hap what, what happens when you make stuff that isn't meant to be passed around um and is meant to be like sort of like almost like scraps scrap paper um but before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash lean into art is where you can find our presence there. Um, and what is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. It's a way for you to say, I, I believe in you. I believe in the stuff that you make. And I want to support it. And we want to thank five people who have been doing exactly that. First up, I want to thank... India. India, you can find on Twitter at Old Swifty, fabulous cartoonist. Uh, the Girl in the Glim just came out recently. Uh, it looks absolutely gorgeous. People should check it out. Also, D. Jusan. Speaking of talented cartoonists, uh, at D J U U S A N, working on, I forget what she said, seven years of her comic. Gray is uh, unreal. Uh, Mike White uh, does, also does a comic at F E Follies on Instagram. Thank you, Mike, for believing in us and what we do. Olivia Birdton. You can find Olivia on Twitter at Olivia Birdton. And finally, Kim Holm at Denungaher Holm on Twitter. We will link to it in the show notes. Uh, a lot of letters, a lot of syllables, but uh, you won't be sorry for following him. And if you want to join them, you can go to patreon.com slash lean into art where you, you will find all the shows that we make. 
as well as the extra leans, the shows we record in between episodes um, where Rob and I just riff on a topic and then that post becomes an open mic post where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place where only fellow leaners can participate. We want to thank everybody who has been doing just that and supporting us at patreon.com slash lean into art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It means a lot to us. And the, the page I had up um, was actually Lean Into Art Cast episode 168 on our Patreon, which is idea generating warm ups where we had did some live demoing of some different warm up exercises, right? Yeah, and it's it's a it's a similar situation where like you could ask yourself, well, why would you want to do warm ups in general? And we talked a little bit about that as as we introed this this episode, but um, in a way, you're it's you know, the whole monastic approach. You're getting yourself ready or whatnot, um, or you're getting a group ready in your in in a lot of what you were describing classroom situation, but it seems like everyone's getting ready to work individually. But then in, in Lena Tarcast 168, it was um, one of the exercises we talked about was more suited to getting a group to work together. Right. And to, you know, because there are different frictions and, and challenges for um, when, when people get into a room and especially if they're from the same company and they may have like, you know, um, well, they, they come with their roles and their hats and their sort of their culture and their expectations and their social norms of like, well, I better not say anything. My manager's in this meeting, right? I've got an idea, but I'm going to wait to see what they say. And that, that kind of stuff really hurts the, the collective possible output of a group because it's inherently being so actively filtered. And the, these kind of generation, uh, idea generation warmups we talked about were more about um all right chuck your role out the window you're a person here and you're going to essentially add on to little things that that everyone does and one of the exercises i enjoy for that is called uh, doodle creatures have needs we go into you, that in high detail did you want to demo that right now i mean like I, I see you've got something up on your screen do you want to pull that up and talk about oh it? i was doodling while you were talking about stuff last time right <laughs> So <laughs> this was, uh, it's like that exercise sounds too fun to not do. So I just did a panel oh. of a simple shape ah. character in a, yep. in a moon like landscape. And then it was like, it's kind of a cactus, but I'm like, nah, it's, it's going to be an alien. I can't help it. And so <laughs> that, that's what I have so far. But, um, but a doodle creature has have needs situation is, um, it's it's a it's a combination of of um like structured randomality where you have a name of a creature you have some thing about them that is a trait they have and then you have then they've once people doodle like some you know some silly thing based on that uh where where okay so i in a nutshell round one you get it you get a character named conconator right what does a conconator look like you have one minute to doodle a conconator on a whiteboard that's sitting by a group of people. Okay, cool. Like then next, uh, someone else gets handed the marker and you get the, you know, well, actually the conconator is winged. So, all right, how do, what do we do with this? Then third round, well, guess what? The winged conconator needs an ergonomic workstation. So, invent an ergonomic workstation for the wing conconator as the next layer of this doodle. And, and that's all. So now you've got people um, probably laughing, probably surprised that at their own, um, like they they want to laugh themselves. They, they're probably uh, enjoying the, the, you know, surprising one another and whatnot. So you create this, this safe space of, yeah, ideas need to get out of your heads in this. And, you know, we're warming up for that. But like you got to merge them without a lot of ego and process that gets in the way. So that's definitely another um, another angle on warm ups and how they can benefit uh, groups instead of um, individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also it just gets you into a problem solving mode in a way that is uh, quicker and easier to do because it's not preloaded with all the anxiety around this this other special thing that you've been fretting over for a long time right absolutely uh and it's in just like the situation where you're setting up, up your students to uh safely explore expressing story uh this is about 
safely expressing design for someone that's not you. So then later in this kind of a workshop, we, we, we explore um, actual people's needs and you know, learn from like video clips and other data to, to say like, well, gosh, there is, there are problems. There is this, uh, something that we could do better to address that. And instead of, you know, reaching from your, your, your bucket of pet projects and ideas, whatever, like let's do new things. And, and hopefully, you know, building off of how we made it safe to work together already, we just get to keep doing that and now um, come up with with um, like rough, simple designs, hypotheses that have some kind of uh, credibility because they're not just one person's um, ego. It's benefiting from um, the, I don't know, the, the, the skills and concerns and, and, uh, abilities of everyone in a group. So, so someone who may be like, oh, I come from finance or I come from um, strategy or I, I come from, um, you know, sales and I'm an engineer and I'm a, you know, maybe I'm a physical product engineer and then this other person is a software engineer. And so like, you know, you... I work in manga style. I do auto bio comics. I do action adventure. I do superhero comics. We couldn't be more different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got a sitcom here. This isn't a this isn't a collaborative session. Uh, no, but guess what? The, yeah, the differences can um, enrich. Uh, there's, yeah, the that's something I'm always on the lookout for, and I can, you know, maybe dig up something for show notes where I enjoy encountering and and continually exploring how uh, we do things better through um, diverse perspectives. Uh, and at the very least, you break out of your own ruts and selfishly, don't you, don't you want to do that <laughs> when you try to, when you try to build something, you don't want to just do the same thing you've always done slightly different, right? You've, you've roped us right into 10,000 feet up, right? It's, uh, mm. why, yeah, why do this? Well, there is a selfish practical benefit to getting yourself out of a rut, um, and that, that falls under making making the value of creating something that's just for you, right? Mm. Um, because I, I feel like over the last decade, more and more, the common wisdom has to be like make lots of stuff and share lots of stuff, right? Um, and even the whole selling your sawdust thing, like even the scraps on the floor is something that sh can be packaged up and turned into a thing that makes drives more people into your conversion tunnel. And so on, um, and and I see that with my students in that uh, they they want to make things that are going to matter, right? Hmm. Um, and the thought of making something playfully already at the age of twelve and thirteen is already kind of being pushed aside. So, so. but. It, <laughs> What's weird about this is that sometimes when you put yourself in the in the headspace of, yep, I'm not, I'm not overly attached to making a product out of this. This is not going to contribute to some bigger body of work or an existing process or outcome. It's totally standalone, and I assume it's throwaway. But then, is does it have to be? Because what if what if what you make you're like, oh, that's kind of funny, you know, or. Uh, this like maybe this thing plus my thought about it i kind of i like the idea of sharing that i didn't think i was going to but now here we are like right is there like what's the tension there is that it does that break the monastic practice does that like is it sort no, of no i i don't think so i think okay. that the i i guess i should clarify that my point of view on this is that there's there aren't very many thresholds between what we would call monastic pra practice and actually pursuing a thing. I feel like that transition can be almost invisible when, um, because the comic that I did back 10 years ago now, um, called the front rebirth, which you can find at the front dot me, the furry monster in it, Jared, the abominable snowman was born out of a joke that my wife was making to cheer me up when I was on deadline and having a really hard time of it. 
slips a little piece of paper with this furry monster saying, yo, dudes, guess what? And <laughs> I laughed. She laughed. I kept the drawing because it was, it was, it was, uh, had a lot of sentimental value from like a moment that we shared together. But then as time went on and I looked at that drawing, it hung on my wall. I was like that, God, that's just so charming. That is so charming. I need to do something with that. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's what they call inspiration, right? Yeah. I mean, well, there's, you can f find meaning that you didn't expect. And it's like, these are symbols that came out of your head. And now they're, turns out it's not just noise or it's not just a, a mildly interesting thing or or a loosening up activity uh that okay so you so you've discovered a, a meaning with the symbols so right after the kids and i did this exercise where we did the grid of of figures mm -hmm. um i challenged them and i said you know if you got an idea for a mini comic as we explore today's exercise pursue your own idea for sure but if you really don't know what to write a story about just off the top of your head. You've got a sheet full of characters right here that you can begin to tell, tell, tell me about. And one kid, sure enough, he did this one, which is an idiot. Okay. And so he did an instructional comic where the idiot is teaching you how comics work. It was like Scott McCloud's understanding comics, but as told by an idiot. It was a pretty funny little book, right? Okay. And it was it was totally just him riffing on what he began with as a, a, a 60 second doodle. So yes, that kind of thing can happen too. Um, is he going to make a whole series of these? I don't know. But it got him through an exercise where he was able to, you know, very easily and joy joyfully interact with the comics medium. So mission accomplished there. Um, but yeah, I think that we can but categorizing is such a funny thing, right? Because it implies these divisions that I don't think are quite divisions. And I think they're things that we just slip into from one state to another without like, <laughs> this is actually in Linda Berry's talk, right? And I, I shared the video with you. Do you remember this part where she talked about how children, like children understand play and, and adults have a hard time re-engaging with play. And she said, if you, if you wanna know what, I, what the difference is, no child sits down with her Barbie and Ken doll and says, okay, Ken, Barbie, this is gonna be a three act play. Uh, there's going to be some tension in the middle. If one, of, if one of you are going to misunderstand something and one of you is going to walk out, but then you're going to win the, the other one back, right? There's th there's not this whole front ending of structure. It's like plays is something that just like kind of ebbs and flows in and out of the daily experience, right? And I, th I feel like that's kind of how art feels to me a lot of times. It's, and if there there's a, either route can work. You can say that, well, okay, this exercise where, you know, we've been describing it's a structure and it's also not that much structure. It's essentially a playground. It's, it's not a, a playground with a manual and, a, a, you know, five trainings you must attend before you get on the swing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. I, I thank you. That's a good clarification to make is that there's play where it's unstructured and then there's play where it's like, we're playing monopoly. Well, before we play, we have to agree on a few parameters in order to engage with the play activity, right? And well, you can go and then there's okay, monopoly that okay, now there's a game, there's a system to get into and maybe that's that's the kind of thing that that works for you. But then there's um there are games that are way more complicated than monopoly too. Uh that that get far more into um prescription versus creating a space for discovery and accidents and it's like how much how much structure do you need before you're open to accidents and not not as not as anxious or concerned and then let's see um accidents as far as the the production but also the possibility that then the outcomes are unknown too of like, I don't know what's going to happen during, and I don't know what's going to happen after. And, oh, I'm okay with that. Or I'm way not okay with that because I sell my sawdust. Gosh darn it. I, I, when I produce a thing, I know what fell off the thing and I know how to use the thing that fell off the thing. And yeah, yeah that's, I wish I always did. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm role-playing. I don't know how to, so, <laughs> yeah, I've got, I'm, I'm swimming in sawdust over here. So, <laughs> it's a mystery uh. <laughs> <laughs> right 
Right. And, and there's, there's, um, some, some of these warm ups I do with my students. Um, and this is a privilege of being in the Miyagi role is I don't let them know exactly what's going to happen sometimes. Um, another warm up that we do is the, uh, the eight minute warm up. Are you, are you familiar with this one? Um, where you draw something six times. Yeah. I mean, I've, um, I've, I've used morphed versions of this where okay. doesn't it work out where you have like a, like a almost comfortable amount of time to start. And, and then you have like an extremely uncomfortable amount of time to start. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you, you divide a page into six squares and in the first square you draw as best as you can with as much detail as you can, a thing, usually with some visual reference and you have, um, four minutes. Right. And I tell my students like, this first square, you got four minutes. It's a luxury of time. You're going to feel like it's too much time, but try to get as much detail as possible in there. Um, then they move on to the second square and now you got two minutes and like, suddenly it's like, oh, that, this is a breeze. Right. And then I'm like, okay, well, next square, you've got one minute. And then I distract them by, we all do a stretching exercise where we put out our arms and we, you know, pull on our hands like this oh, to stretch nice. out our, you know, because you can injure yourself drawing and I want to get them into the habit of actually, you know, stretching their muscles before they get into yeah. uh, vigorous drawing activities. And then I'm like, okay, now we're moving on to the second row. Now you have uh, 30 seconds. No, you know, <laughs> they, they didn't see it coming. And so now they're like, why you can't draw it in 30 seconds. I'm like, well, you're gonna have to try, you know? And then it goes 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and five seconds. And the last one is, is if they try, like if they really give it their best, it's the best one almost every time. Uh, because like you just get to see like almost like this cartoonish contour of the object and see what like sort of what it looks like in their hazy mind's eye rather than, you know, focusing on all those little nuts and bolts and details in the inside of the object. But um, yeah. I love that exercise. That I love that exercise. It's a... Uh, it's an example of having some rules and a progression, a progression to the rules and whatnot. And it's a, uh, it's another fantastic warm up that I think is also great individually and in groups. It's, uh, and it's, it's definitely one that what, what gets produced is I have not seen much come out of that. That's reusable other than you get the, you get the exp the exhilaration like you you've carried you're you're pumping up yourself or a group of people to carry some energy forward out of that where they're like wow i i had no idea i would draw something in 5 seconds and this goes back to that internal accumulation of material rather than external in that what i find the students discover is they discover sort of what their speed limit is in that Yes, for some of them, four minutes was way too much time and they noodled on it and they made it look like a mess because they put too much stuff in. And all of a sudden they get to like uh, the one minute one and it's like, it looks really good. Like because of the the, the panicking and the energy and like the, 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 the ferocity of trying to like meet the, uh, beat the clock, um, they didn't get fussy and uptight about it and something happens to the line. It gets very loose and kind of free and fun. And suddenly I'm like, well, this one feels like the, the best drawing, doesn't it? You know, they're like, yeah, I don't know why the one looks better. I only had 60 seconds to do it, you know? Well, maybe mm -hmm. you should try using that speed more often in your work. Or you find out that the four minute one is where it was really perfect and it just slowly deteriorated over each successive step. But it, <laughs> there's, a, there's a sense of self-discovery that, that comes out of that too. Um, and yeah, the well, the, the discovery and the experience is what you end up carrying forward from that where it's... Uh, Again, a very safe, safe playground. So that's, uh, I mean, I think we've, we've walked around like the, like the, so you, you know, why do we do that? Why, why do we think these, these warm ups and cool downs are, are beneficial? And there's like an individual and group angle, but like, um, is there, is there another, is, it, is there a final thought? Is that yeah. where you're headed with this? That's what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> is there a final thought is the question that i'm asking and i'm betting there is um, yeah. i'm going to count on us to find our way to it after we talk about we'll take one more break about a minute and 30 odd seconds oh, we got to thank some other people who make the show possible and those people happen to be us we make the show every week almost every week and uh we um we make stuff, you know, like we don't just think about stuff. We actually, uh, what are the, how do the kids put it? We walk the walk. And, uh, the thing that I hope you will check out of mine, uh, today 
is Boulder and Fleet at boulderandfleet.com. What is it? It's two best friends that go on adventures, animals, and you know, doing people things. Uh, big, strong bear, ambitious, super fast little bird whose superpower is uh, detecting problems. And uh, get, you know, getting into trouble with lizard miners and uh, mineral people who eat precious metals. You can find it at boulderandfleet.com. There's also a Patreon you can find at uh, patreon.com slash jersey. Also, if you go to tinyastronaut.com, that's where you can get the mini comics. I just uh, uh, posted a whole bunch of new uh, physical mini comics, paper mini comics that have screen printed covers and letter pressed covers that you can purchase um, and share with your friends and family. Rob, you make a game. Let me pull up the website first, and then I'm going to pull up the game, and I'll play it while you talk about it. How's that? That's really cool. While you're while you're pulling them, pulling that up, I just got to say, uh, Boulder and Fleet have have this have this great relationship, and there's fun fun tension where like with how powerful Boulder is, yet how reserved, and then how how much just and how ambitious fleet is and how she just wants to really make it you know what i mean it's like i identify with these with these characters and the whole like in that in, the, in that sort of uh i don't know just trying to put things together to, to get your um i don't know find your successful thing or whatever i just there's so many cool uh themes that resonate with there and then the, the, then they battle a big stink uh, swamp beast which is amazing so <laughs> yeah this panda needs you is a game that i make and jersey's playing it right now um where you start this game it's just this really mellow puzzle game meant for all ages but especially you know certainly open to the little ones uh in, in your life where uh it's about pattern matching and learning shapes and uh this little panda walking through a bamboo forest encounters some pattern of blocks and it's like well this is a physics and you know color matching puzzle actually because the blocks get mixed up. A cloud comes along and blows them all over. They go wacky oh. all over the place, right? And so now this this panda is like waiting for you to help help her put put them put them right, and celebrates your work along the way. It's like as you're you know making progress, the panda's going to dance. The music gets happier until woohoo, you did it. And there's like over 50 levels of this that you you tackle sort of like in one little 10 calm low, calm loop at a time. And, uh, but little by little, it gets harder and harder. You got, you know, more shapes to deal with, more space conundrums and all that. And, um, but yeah, you'll be ready for it because you'll have practiced. Anyway, that's, uh, you learn more about it at this pan, this dash panda.com. And it's on lots of platforms, Android, iOS, um, the, you know, phones and tablets. It's also on desktops for Mac and Windows at itch.io.com. And if you purchased it, uh, a great thing you could do, if you haven't already, is give it a rating wherever you bought it. So that helps more people find it. And speaking of helping more people find stuff, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, giving the video a thumbs up helps more people find the show. If you're listening to it through a podcatcher like iTunes, giving the show a five-star review helps more people find the show. It's a free thing you can do right now. And speaking of free, if you go to leanatort.com slash workshops, there's free videos you can download at a price of your choosing, which includes free. But, you know, these are workshops that we make, uh, self-contained, sort of uh, uh, classroom-tested things that we've used to teach people. Um, you can download them at a price of your choosing. If you do derive value out of it, out of them a great thing you could do is go back and then actually purchase them and that's like leaving us a tip or you know gift it for a friend you know i recently got contacted by somebody who said that they wanted to get some uh, comic instruction for their um artistic young uh child in their life and i was like well there you go you can download these at a price you're choosing today leanatart.com slash workshops and we thank everybody who has interacted with all the stuff that we make it means a lot to us it really does thank you very much all right final thought time rob what are we so, talking about? Um, okay. There's a, I think there's a theme of you, you have, you have your creative habits, you've got your tools and techniques. And in a way we're pointing out this, this kind of optional side path that may not be, may not be in everyone's toolbox, may not be a familiar thing, whether you're doing stuff in, in a group or not, maybe it's just, you know, a normal, normal and comfortable or not comfortable, but just normal uh, to just jump in, you know, there's work to be done. Let's go for it. Uh, what, uh, what, what do you think like for, for you and, and, um, and for those that you, that you've taught, like what, what would you, what would you say is like the, um, I guess something that's like the best reason, the best takeaway for this, like where you, 
you, you think warming up is uh, warming up is great. It's it's uh oh so philosophically mm -hmm. I am of the I am oriented toward trying to keep the joy in the thing. Mm -hmm. And I was just having this discussion recently with a friend of mine, a very a friend who I've been friends with for like 20 years. And we were talking about uh, that time of our lives where, you know, when you're in your, like your teens or your early 20s and like some band or music like really helps to sculpt your identity, right? And like when I was when I was 19, like I was over the moon for They Might Be Giants. Like I, mean, I was like the kid who would like drive 30 minutes out of town, maybe even as far as four hours out of town to find some out of the way rare single, a single, right? There's three songs on the freaking CD, right? Wow. Um, and when I found it, the, like the rush was so intense, you know, I was like, oh my gosh. And like, and it was putting the CD in, I would like tell my roommates, I'm like, don't talk, you know, I need to experience this, like the, that whole thing, right? <laughs> and 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 this came up just because they might be giants had a new album just recently came out and i was like oh i'll have to check that out you know like this this friend of mine was like oh what's happened to you man you know i'm like well you know it's like when you go through something so many times like the edges get worn off on it they have to necessarily but there's certain things where it's like i don't ever want that youthful joy to vanish from it and and like that's that's my art i want it to feel like that as much as i possibly can and i do think that there are tricks you can play on yourself there's ways you can engineer the experience to like remind you of and that's what that's one of the functions of a warm up to me is that a warm up reminds me is that this collection of skills I have is like it's an it's an amassing of a hundred thousand tiny little skills and reacquainting myself with one of those little skills again reminds me of when I made one of those unlocks in my early days like when I learned to draw somebody with their arms crossed like this after practicing and practicing and practicing and the one time I got it right like that that's a pretty big rush you know. Um, so it's a way for, for me to reacquaint myself with the joyfulness of it in that it's low risk, it's playful, but also to remind me that, oh, that's right. This isn't skill. Isn't this gigantic stone word that hangs above me, uh, that skill is made up of all these tiny, tiny little particles like sand. And, uh, I can go and revisit each one of those little ones from time to time. Is that, did that get too poetic and weird and metaphysical? I don't know. But Oh, you should have at least lit, lit a few candles for this. Um, <laughs> this, I, I think you could, you could have gotten a lot more metaphysical. No, it's, uh, I, I love it because so the, the, the joy and, um, how, uh, so essentially the, the joy seems to come from the, what is it? The, is it the, it's the, the, the safety and the playfulness that's so easy to emphasize in a throwaway or potentially throwaway work versus the serious work that well, like you can say, Hey, be, have fun while you're doing your big serious thing. But like, for some reason it's harder. It is harder. Stakes. It's way harder. Be yeah. Well, it, it's, it's harder because yeah, it, it, there's, it feels like there's stakes. It feels like there's more on the line. Um, it feels like, uh, it, you're investing a lot of time into it. So of course you want there to be some kind of payoff in there. Um, whether it's financial or whether it's respect, whether it's like recognition, whatever it is, you're looking for some kind of like, uh, reciprocation of all this effort you're putting into the thing. Um, whereas when you play as a child on the playground, Again, you're not talking about like, okay, this is gonna have a three act structure. This like it's more of like this this uh, investigating and finding and it's and playing on the playground's the ultimate throwaway endeavor because it vanishes the moment the bell rings. Right. Mm -hmm. Um and I've often made that comparison. It was like when I feel like I'm writing my when I feel like I'm having the best time making comics, it's when I'm doing it in that way. I'm not always making the best comics, right? Because it, it inevitably it is going to get hard and it should. Um, because it that that's at least for me, that's a signal that I'm doing something meaningful and that effort is going to lead me to, uh, hopefully some kind of like skill unlock that, uh, you know, helps broaden my perspective as a cartoonist. I mean, at some point it's the professionalization of the thing where at yeah. some point the, the effort you put into it has, will lead to a commitment, will lead to an agreement like a, or a contract or whatever. And then the nature of the activity, um, you still can be really skilled at being playful about it. 
but mm-hmm. there it i think it's it's reasonable to to have it be a lot harder to be as playful about it yeah. even if even if you're just really good at that that kind of you know fun joyful um habitual um just engaging with challenges with a uh, a lightheartedness instead of like all right this is the real deal we've got to get it done um I think it makes a lot of sense. The one that like, it was funny, you, you, you put this word in the notes, but, but uh, it really deeply resonates with me for um, both individually and collectively. I think it's, in, maybe it's how I'm wired, but I worry about the, um, how we can be so imprisoned by assumptions mm. and our biases and those kind of habits that lock us in where, where individually or collectively uh, and, and somehow reminding myself and that or being fortunate to like help facilitate a group of others who are uh needing to just say okay i have this idea and i'm going to call it an assumption i'm going to put it you know put it into the collective um pool and then now it can be managed and explored or integrated or combined or tested and having it be safe to do that to me lets us accomplish something that at the very least is beyond what we could have done without making it safe to try to escape or engage differently with our own assumptions one of the things that i try to take as seriously as i can is watching out from watching out for moments where I might be pushing a dogma on my students. This is the way you do it. This is the right way to do it. And this, this is the way you do it. That's all. Come on. You got to do it right. You got to not do it right. Even when we're getting like a little bit like punchy and lighthearted in the room, like I'll feel that temptation sometimes like, okay, well, you know, if you want to do it right, use this pencil, right? You got to use some blue pencil here. You got to use this kind of eraser here. Um, And I feel like, warm-ups also protect me from that too right because those those kinds of um assumptions and dogmas because this is the way i've done it that's all um can and i and in my not proud moments i've heard myself arguing with other cartoonists over the right and wrong way to do certain things right (laughs) um uh but it's so tempting because it feels so good to feel like no i i I am absolutely in the right on this you are absolutely in the wrong on this um but uh, I've noticed that every time I've ever done that, with at least with regards to art, I'm not going to talk about any other as- aspect of my life, but when it comes to like exploring art and technique and, and storytelling approaches, um, if, inevitably when I come around to seeing what they were actually saying, I'm like, oh, I actually would have benefited from that. you know. Um, so that's another thing is like getting out of comfort zones is a way to remind me that I haven't figured this all out yet. Um, mm. Save me from ever feeling like I've got this all figured out. Uh, is a nobody wants to be around that dude and b uh i don't want the this goes back to that fun thing it's going to stop being fun if i ever feel like i've truly mastered it well and it's it's you you have a more open to learning mindset by being willing to just to try to see these um these skills these practices dogmas assumptions and say that um maybe there's some other option and so uh, you've inherently opened up to, uh, you know, the possibility of something new, or, or at least even re-engaging with uh, a different, a different appreciation, maybe uh, of the thing that you you already had. But uh, that's so that I mean, yeah, warm ups. And uh, I know we talked up, we we talked about cool downs uh, in the title and stuff, but like, oh, I don't know, maybe really we'll have to about- we'll have to hit cool downs maybe as a, as another future thing. Yeah, because cooldowns are a different thing altogether that I run in the classroom. Yeah. Um, it's it's a much, I mean, there's even more emphasis on play and illogic and uh, le- even less structure to it. And mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, I even invite the students to to I challenge them to hack the game, you know, um, mm. because this is meant to be just like sort of like the uh, well the artistic equivalent of like wrestling on the playground <laughs> kind of thing, right? Um, okay. All structure is out the window. Yeah. Just, yeah. Get your get your your big big feelings and need to move out of your system. 
or yeah. or like you know there's some amount of tension that built up in this performance so yeah very much so very much so yes uh cartooning well a lot of visual arts ask you to sit alone and quiet for a long period of time um, not all of them but a lot of them sort of are, st are historically structured that way maybe you work in a studio but still there's gonna be like some very very focused activity and i mean especially with children but also i think as adults it's like we have to I, I, th I find great benefit in having some kind of cool down to reacquaint me with what it's like to be a human being. Um, the example, and this will be the teaser for when we do a cool down episode, hmm. is the example I think of is when I get into like really good flow state when I'm working on a difficult storytelling problem or I'm like really in the zone with inking and then all of a sudden like the alarm goes off I'm like, oh crap, I'm supposed to go pick up my wife and I go pick her up from work and I'm driving, we're driving home and uh, she's like, what's wrong? Is everything okay? I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm in that weird headspace where I, I it looks like I'm angry and I'm totally not. I'm just in that kind of like focused problem solving mode. Um, mm, yeah, shift, and, shifting gears or transitioning. Yeah, you're about to go back into the world. So let's create some kind of thing that gets you up and moving and thinking out loud in, in a non-structured playful way so that you can be a human being again instead of this critical uh, creative machine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I think there's there could be there could be more to dig into there, but uh there always is, Rob, but I think we did a podcast this time. So Yes, this time we did. <laughs> I hope you feel better. I I heard you coughing a little bit during this episode. I hope that you That are... was nothing compared to like last week. I couldn't have done a video podcast last week. It um <sighs> yeah. That so yeah, and thank you. I am I'm feeling much better. Well, we'll look forward to talking with you again next week for another episode of Lean It's Art. By the way, we record the show every Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central. We stream it live on YouTube at uh, leanintoart.com slash live. And then it's collected as a podcast, uh, both video and audio at patreon.com slash lean into art. And we'll be back next week. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been, uh, well, and I want to thank you, Jer Jersey. I love doing this show. I, it bums me out when I miss it. And uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. So thank you for recording this with me. And, uh, uh, and as far as who I am, I am Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. You know what? How about I turn the volume up? Mm -hmm. You can also follow us on Twitter at there we go. the user Lean Into Art, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Alrighty, I'm going to shut off the stream. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Yeah, thanks for hanging out.